Chapter Eight of the Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Accompanies Mr. Pecksniff and his charming daughters to the city of London, and relates what fell out upon their way thither. When Mr. Pecksniff and the two young ladies got into the heavy coach at the end of the lane, they found it empty, which was a great comfort, particularly as the outside was quite full, and the passengers looked very frosty. For as Mr. Pecksniff justly observed, when he and his daughters had burrowed their feet deep in the straw, wrapped themselves to the chin, and pulled up both windows, it is always satisfactory to feel, in keen weather, that many other people are not as warm as you are. And this, he said, was quite natural, and a very beautiful arrangement, not confined to coaches, but extending itself into many social ramifications. For, he observed, if every one were warm and well fed, we should lose the satisfaction of admiring the fortitude with which certain conditions of men bear cold and hunger, and if we were no better off than anybody else, what would become of our sense of gratitude? Which, said Mr. Pecksniff, with tears in his eyes, as he shook his fist at a beggar who wanted to get up behind, is one of the holiest feelings of our common nature. His children heard with becoming reverence these moral precepts from the lips of their father, and signified their acquiescence in the same by smiles, that he might the better feed and cherish that sacred flame of gratitude in his breast. Mr. Pecksniff remarked that he would trouble his eldest daughter, even in this early stage of their journey, for the brandy-bottle, and from the narrow neck of that stone vessel he imbibed a copious refreshment. "'What are we?' said Mr. Pecksniff. "'But coaches. Some of us are slow coaches.' "'Goodness, Pa!' cried Charity. "'Some of us, I say,' resumed her parent with increased emphasis, "'are slow coaches. Some of us are fast coaches. Our passions are the horses and rampant animals, too.' "'Really, Pa!' cried both the daughters at once. "'How very unpleasant!' and rampant animals too repeated mr pecksniff with so much determination that he may be said to have exhibited at the moment a sort of moral rampancy himself and virtue is the drag we start from the mother's arms and we run to the dust shovel when he had said this mr pecksniff being exhausted took some further refreshment when he had done that he corked the bottle tight with the air of a man who had effectually corked the subject also and went to sleep for three stages. The tendency of mankind, when it falls asleep in coaches, is to wake up cross, to find its legs in its way, and its corns an aggravation. Mr. Pecksniff, not being exempt from the common lot of humanity, found himself, at the end of his nap, so decidedly the victim of these infirmities, that he had an irresistible inclination to visit them upon his daughters, which he had already begun to do in the shape of diverse random kicks and other unexpected motions of his shoes, when the coach stopped, and after a short delay the door was opened. "'Now mind,' said a thin, sharp voice in the dark, "'I and my son go inside, because the roof is full. But if you agree only to charge us outside prices, it is quite understood that we won't pay more, is it?' "'All right, sir,' replied the guard. "'Is there anybody else inside now?' inquired the voice. Three passengers returned the guard. Then I asked the three passengers to witness this bargain. If they will be so good, said the voice, my boy, I think we may safely get in. In pursuance of which opinion, two people took their seats in the vehicle, which was solemnly licensed by Act of Parliament to carry any six persons who could be got in at the door. That was lucky, whispered the old man when they moved on again, and a great stroke of policy in you to observe it. <laughs> we wouldn't have gone outside. I should have died of the rheumatism. Whether it occurred to the dutiful son that he had in some degree overreached himself by contributing to the prolongation of his father's days, or whether the cold had affected his temper, it is doubtful. But he gave his father such a nudge in reply that the good old gentleman was taken with a cough which lasted for a full five minutes without intermission, and goaded Mr. Pecksniff into that pitch of irritation that he said at last, and very suddenly, "'There is no room, there really is no room in this coach for any gentleman with a cold in his head.' "'Mine,' said the old man, after a moment's pause, "'is upon my chest, Pecksniff.' 
the voice and manner together now that he spoke out the composure of the speaker the presence of his son and his knowledge of mr pecksniff afforded a clue to his identity which it was impossible to mistake hmm i thought said mr pecksniff returning to his usual mildness that i addressed a stranger i find that i address a relative mr anthony chuzzlewit and his son mr jonas for they my dear children are our travelling companions will excuse me for an apparently harsh remark it is not my desire to wound the feelings of any person with whom i am connected in family bonds i may be a hypocrite said mr pecksniff cuttingly but i am not a brute pooh pooh said the old man what signifies that word pecksniff hypocrite we were all hypocrites t'other day i am sure i felt that to be agreed upon amongst us or i shouldn't have called you one we should not have been there at all if we had not been hypocrites the only difference between you and the rest was shall i tell you the difference between you and the rest now pecksniff if you please my good sir if you please why the annoying quality in you is said the old man that you never have a confederate or partner in your juggling you would deceive everybody even those who practise the same art and have a way with you as if you <laughs> as if you really believed yourself i'd lay a handsome wager now said the old man if i laid wages which i don't and never did that you keep up appearance by a tacit understanding even before your own daughters here now i when i have a business scheme in hand tell jonas what it is and we discuss it openly you're not offended pecksniff offended my good sir cried that gentleman as if he had received the highest compliments that language could convey are you travelling to london mr pecksniff asked the son yes mr jonas we are all travelling to london we shall have the pleasure of your company all the way i trust oh god you had better ask father that said jonas i am not going to commit myself mr pecksniff was as a matter of course greatly entertained by this retort his mirth having subsided mr jonas gave him to understand that himself and parent were in fact travelling to their home in the metropolis and that since the memorable day of the great family gathering they had been tarrying in that part of the country watching the sale of a certain eligible investments which they had in their co-partnership eye when they came down for it was their custom mr jonas said whenever such a thing was practicable to kill two birds with one stone and never to throw away sprats but as a bait for whales when he had communicated to mr pecksniff these pithy scraps of intelligence he said that if it was all the same to him he would turn him over to father and have a chat with the gals and in furtherance of this polite scheme he vacated his seat adjoining that gentleman and established himself in the opposite corner next to the fair miss mercy the education of mr jonas had been conducted from his cradle on the strictest principles of the main chance the very first word he learnt to spell was gain and the second when he got into two syllables money but for two results which were not clearly foreseen perhaps by his watchful parent in the beginning his training may be said to have been unexceptionable one of these flaws was that having been long taught by his father to overreach everybody he had imperceptibly acquired a love of overreaching that venerable monitor himself the other that from his early habits of considering everything as a question of property he had gradually come to look with impatience on his parent as a certain amount of personal estate which had no right whatever to be going at large but ought to be secured in that particular description of iron safe which is commonly called a coffin and banked in the grave well cousin said mr jonas because we are cousins you know a few times removed so you're going to london miss mercy replied in the affirmative pinching her sister's arm at the same time and giggling excessively lots of bows in london cousin said mr jonas slightly advancing his elbow indeed sir cried the young lady that won't hurt us sir i dare say and having given him this answer with great demureness she was so overcome by her own humour that she was fain to stifle her merriment in her sister's shawl merry cried that more prudent damsel i really am ashamed of you how can you go on so you wild thing at which miss merry only laughed the more of course i saw a wildness in her eye t'other day said mr jonas addressing charity but you're the one to sit solemn i say you were regularly prim cousin 
oh the old-fashioned fright cried mary in a whisper cherry my dear upon my word you must sit next to him i shall die outright if he talks to you any more i shall positively to prevent which fatal consequence the buoyant creature skipped out of her seat as she spoke and squeezed her sister into the place from which she had risen don't mind crowding me cried mr jonas i like to be crowded by gals come a little closer cousin no thank you sir said charity there's that other one laughing again said mr jonas she's a laughing at my father i shouldn't wonder if he puts on that old flannel nightcap of his i don't know what she'll do is that my father a snoring pecksniff yes mr jonas tread upon his foot will you be so good said the young gentleman the foot next to you's the gouty one mr pecksniff hesitating to perform this friendly office mr jonas did it himself at the same time crying come wake up father or you'll be having the nightmare and screeching out i know do you ever have the nightmare cousin he asks his neighbour with characteristic gallantry as he dropped his voice again sometimes answered charity not often the other one said mr jonas after a pause does she ever have the nightmare i don't know replied charity you'd better ask her she laughs so said jonas there's no talking to her only hark how she's a-going on now you're the sensible one cousin tut tut cried charity oh but you are you know you are mercy is a little giddy said miss charity but she'll sober down in time it'll be a very long time then if she does at all rejoined her cousin take a little more room i'm afraid of crowding you said charity but she took it notwithstanding and after one or two remarks on the extreme heaviness of the coach and the number of places it stopped at they fell into a silence which remained unbroken by any member of the party until supper time although mr jonas conducted charity to the hotel and sat himself beside her at the board it was pretty clear that he had an eye to the other one also for he often glanced across at mercy and seemed to draw comparisons between the personal appearance of the two which were not unfavourable to the superior plumpness of the younger sister he allowed himself no great leisure for this kind of observation however being busily engaged with the supper which as he whispered in his fair companion's ear was a contract business and therefore the more she ate the better the bargain was his father and mr pecksniff probably acting on the same wise principle demolished everything that came within their reach and by that means acquired a greasy expression of countenance indicating contentment if not repletion which it was very pleasant to contemplate when they could eat no more mr pecksniff and mr jonas subscribed for two sixpenny worths of hot brandy and water which the latter gentleman considered a more politic order than one shilling's worth there being a chance of their getting more spirit out of the innkeeper under this arrangement than if it were all in one glass having swallowed his share of the enlivening fluid mr pecksniff under pretence of going to see if the coach were ready went secretly to the bar and had his own little bottle filled in order that he might refresh himself at leisure in the dark coach without being observed these arrangements concluded and the coach being ready they got into their old places and jogged on again but before he composed himself for a nap mr pecksniff delivered a kind of grace after meat in these words the process of digestion as i have been informed by anatomical friends is one of the most wonderful works of nature i do not know how it may be with others but it is a great satisfaction to me to know when regaling on my humble fare that i am putting in motion the most beautiful machinery with which we have any acquaintance i really feel at such times as if i was doing a public service when i have wound myself up if i may employ such a term said mr pecksniff with exquisite tenderness and know that i am going i feel that in the lesson afforded by the works within me i am a benefactor to my kind as nothing could be added to this nothing was said and mr pecksniff exulting it may be presumed in his moral utility went to sleep again the rest of the night wore away in the usual manner mr pecksniff and old antony kept tumbling against each other and waking up much terrified or crushed their heads in opposite corners of the coach and strangely tattooed the surface of their faces heaven knows how in their sleep the coach stopped and went on and went on and stopped times out of number passengers got up and passengers got down and fresh horses came and went and came again with scarcely any interval between each team 
as it seemed to those who were dozing, and with a gap of a whole night between every one as it seemed to those who were broad awake. At length they began to jolt and rumble over horribly uneven stones, and Mr. Pecksniff, looking out of the window, said it was to-morrow morning, and they were there. Very soon afterwards the coach stopped at the office in the city, and the street in which it was situated was already in a bustle that fully bore out Mr. Pecksniff's words about its being morning, though for any signs of day yet appearing in the sky it might have been midnight. There was a dense fog, too, as if it were a city in the clouds which they had been travelling to all night up a magic beanstalk, and there was a thick crust upon the pavement like oil cake which one of the outsides mad no doubt said to another his keeper of course was snow taking a confused leave of antony and his son and leaving the luggage of himself and his daughters at the office to be called for afterwards mr pecksniff with one of the young ladies under each arm dived across the street and then across other streets and so up the queerest courts and down the strangest alleys and under the blindest archways in a kind of frenzy now skipping over a kennel, now running for his life from a coach and horses, now thinking he had lost his way, now thinking he had found it, now in a state of the highest confidence, now despondent to the last degree, but always in a great perspiration and flurry, until at length they stopped in a kind of paved yard near the monument. That is to say, Mr. Pecksniff told them so, for as to anything they could see of the monument, or anything else of the buildings close at hand, they might as well have been playing blind man's buff at Salisbury. Mr. Pecksniff looked about him for a moment, and then knocked at the door of a very dingy edifice. Even among the choice collection of dingy edifices at hand, on the front of which was a little oval board like a tea-tray, with this inscription, Commercial Boarding House, M. Todgers. It seemed that M. Todgers was not up yet, for Mr. Pecksniff knocked twice and rang thrice, without making any impression on anything but a dog over the way. At last a chain and some bolts were withdrawn, with a rusty noise, as if the weather had made the very fastenings hoarse, and a small boy with a large red head, and no nose to speak of, and a very dirty Wellington boot on his left arm, appeared, who, being surprised, rubbed the nose just mentioned with the back of his shoe-brush and said nothing. "'Still abed, my man?' asked Mr. Pecksniff. "'Still abed,' replied the boy. "'I wish they was still abed. "'They're very noisy abed, all calling out for their boots at once. "'I thought you was the paper, and wondered why you didn't shove yourself through the grating as usual. "'What do you want?' "'Considering his years, which were tender, "'the youth may be said to have preferred this question sternly, "'and in something of a defiant manner. "'But Mr. Pecksniff, without taking umbrage at his bearing, "'put a card in his hand, and bade him take that upstairs, and show them in the meanwhile into a room where there was a fire. Or, if there's one in the eating parlour, said Mr. Pecksniff, I can find it myself. So he led his daughters, without waiting for any further introduction, into a room on the ground floor, where a tablecloth, rather a tight and scanty fit in reference to the table it covered, was already spread for breakfast, displaying a mighty dish of pink boiled beef, an instance of that particular style of loaf which is known to housekeepers as a slack-baked crummy quatrain, a liberal provision of cups and saucers, and the usual appendages. Inside the fender were some half a dozen pairs of shoes and boots of various sizes, just cleaned and turned with the soles upwards to dry, and a pair of short black gaiters, on one of which was chalked, in sport it would appear, by some gentleman who had slipped down for the purpose, pending his toilet, and gone up again. Jenkins particular while the other exhibited a sketch in profile, claiming to be the portrait of Jenkins himself. M. Todger's commercial boarding-house was a house of that sort which is likely to be dark at any time, but that morning it was especially dark. There was an odd smell in the passage, as if the concentrated essence of all the dinners that had been cooked in the kitchen since the house was built lingered at the top of the kitchen stairs to that hour, and like the black friar in Don Juan, wouldn't be driven away. In particular there was a sensation of cabbage, as if all the greens that had ever been boiled there were evergreens, and flourished in immortal strength. The parlour was wainscotted, and communicated to strangers a magnetic and instinctive consciousness of rats and mice. The staircase was very gloomy and very broad, with balustrades so thick and heavy that they would have served for a bridge. 
in a sombre corner of the first landing stood a gruff old giant of a clock with a preposterous coronet of three brass balls on his head whom few had ever seen none ever looked in the face and who seemed to continue his heavy tick for no other reason than to warn heedless people from running into him accidentally it had not been papered or painted hadn't todgers within the memory of man it was very black begrimed and mouldy and at the top of the staircase was an old-fashioned disjointed rickety ill-favoured skylight patched and mended in all kinds of ways which looked distrustfully down at everything that passed below and covered todgers up as if it were a sort of human cucumber frame and only people of a peculiar growth were reared there mr pecksniff and his fair daughters had not stood warming themselves at the fire ten minutes when the sound of feet was heard upon the stairs and the presiding deity of the establishment came hurrying in m todgers was a lady rather a bony and hard-featured lady with a row of curls in the front of her head shaped like little barrels of beer and on the top of it something made of net you couldn't call it a cap exactly which looked like a black cobweb she had a little basket on her arm and in it a bunch of keys that jingled as she came in her other hand she bore a flaming tallow candle which after surveying mr pecksniff for one instant by its light she put it down upon the table to the end that she might receive him with the greater cordiality mr pecksniff cried mrs todgers welcome to london who would have thought of such a visit as this after so dear dear so many years how do you do mr pecksniff as well as ever and glad to see you as ever mr pecksniff made response why you are younger than you used to be you are i am sure said mrs todgers you're not a bit changed what do you say to this cried mr pecksniff stretching out his hand towards the young ladies does this make me no older not your daughters exclaimed the lady raising her hands and clasping them oh no mr pecksniff your second and her bridesmaid mr pecksniff smiled complacently shook his head and said my daughters mrs todgers merely my daughters ah sighed the good lady i must believe you for now i look at em i should think i'd have known em anywhere my dear miss pecksniffs how happy your pa has made me she hugged them both and being by this time overpowered by her feelings or the inclemency of the morning jerked a little pocket handkerchief out of the little basket and applied the same to her face now my good madam said mr pecksniff i know the rules of your establishment and that you only receive gentlemen boarders but it occurred to me when i left home that perhaps you would give my daughters house room and make an exception in their favour perhaps cried mrs todgers ecstatically perhaps i may say then that i was sure you would said mr pecksniff i know that you have a little room of your own and that they can be comfortable there without appearing at the general table dear girls said mrs todgers i must take that liberty once more mrs todgers meant by this that she must embrace them once more which she accordingly did with great ardour but the truth was that the house being full with the exception of one bed which would now be occupied by mr pecksniff she wanted time for consideration and so much time too for it was a knotty point how to dispose of them and even when the second embrace was over she stood for some moments gazing at the sisters with affection beaming in one eye and calculation shining out of the other i think i know how to arrange it said mrs todgers at length a sofa bedstead in the little third room which opens from my own parlour oh you dear girls thereupon she embraced them once more observing that she could not decide which was most like their poor mother which was highly probable seeing that she had never beheld that lady but that she rather thought the youngest was and then she said that as the gentlemen would be down directly and the ladies were fatigued with travelling would they step into her room at once it was on the same floor being in fact the back parlour and had as mrs todgers said the great advantage in london of not being overlooked as they would see when the fog cleared off nor was this a vainglorious boast for it commanded at a perspective of two feet a brown wall with a black cistern on the top the sleeping apartment designed for the young ladies was approached from this chamber by a mightily convenient little door which would only open when fallen against by a strong person it commanded from a similar point of sight another angle of the wall and the other side of the cistern 
not the damp side said mrs todgers that is mr jinkins in the first of these sanctuaries a fire was speedily kindled by the youthful porter who whistling at his work in the absence of mrs todgers not to mention his sketching fingers on his corduroys with burnt firewood and being afterwards taken by that lady in the fact was dismissed with a box on his ears having prepared breakfast for the young ladies with her own hands she withdrew to preside in the other room where the joke at mr jinkins's expense seemed to be proceeding rather noisily i won't ask you yet my dears said mr pecksniff looking in at the door how you like london shall i we haven't seen much of it pa cried mary nothing i hope said cherry both very miserably indeed said mr pecksniff that's true we have our pleasure and our business too before us all in good time all in good time whether mr pecksniff's business in london was as strictly professional as he had given his new pupil to understand we shall see to adopt that worthy man's phraseology all in good time End of chapter eight